Hi everyone, welcome to the Neuro 481 course. Uh, I'm really excited for this course. I hope we can make it meaningful for all of you. Obviously, we're a bit limited this semester with the pandemic still going on. Uh, last semester when uh, the coronavirus hit, I started making these online lectures and uh, students seem to really enjoy them because it allows them to kind of go at their own pace and make sure they got all the information. Um, and it's kind of forced me to put in some better figures than what I draw on the board and things like that. So I, I think it's good for everyone in a way. I, I think the weaknesses though are that um, it's much more valuable when you guys can ask questions in person and uh, I can kind of gauge whether you're grasping everything or not. And it's just a lot more fun to have the course in person. Plus the lab portion, you, you have to have in person because that's how you get your hands-on experience. And so that's gonna be more limited this semester. Um, <clears throat> now, they, they say that um, one hour of theory is worth hundreds of hours of experimentation, and that's true. But there's also the reverse component where uh, you might have read something a hundred times in a textbook, but until you actually try and prove that it's right with an experiment or set up an experiment or uh, answer your own uh, experimental questions, your own research questions, uh, you don't realize how hard some things can be and you don't realize all the logistics and the technicalities and things. So I think if, if this were an ideal course, we would kind of cover some of the theory and then let you do some hands-on work and then go back to the theory again. And, and um, really, I guess that's what grad school is. So you'll get that eventually, I hope. Uh, some of you will, will be going to grad school, some of you med school or other clinical sciences, and uh, some of you are done with school and that's okay too. But I hope this can be a very interesting course for everyone. One of the most valuable components of this course is just the ability for us to chat about whatever you guys find interesting and obviously this semester that's a lot more limited so i apologize for that but feel free to email me and and uh we can still chat about whatever topics you find interesting so um okay with that said let's just jump into today's topic which is uh, microscopy and uh, the main reason for this is that we're going to be doing a lot of neurohistology as the course progresses um, but microscopy in and of itself is an extraordinary field. You might think it's kind of an old field, um, old technology, but it's not. There's still numerous studies that are published every year on these significant advancements in uh, microscopy, and especially in neuroscience. At the beginning of the Torah in Genesis 1-3, it says, Vayomer Elohim Yehi Hor Vayahi Hor, meaning, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And you'll see through this whole course that uh, light is sort of the medium through which we learn everything that we know about neuroscience from microscopes and the earliest histology of Golgi and Ramoni Cajal, all the way up through today's modern technologies of MRI and imaging the brain with the electromagnetic forces that are uh, induced by radio frequency pulses in a magnetic field and also electroencephalography, electrophysiology, modeling how neurons fire. All of this is based on electromagnetic forces, which is one of the four fundamental forces of the universe. Okay, so the question I first want to ask you is, what made the microscope? What was the great innovation, the great uh, invention that made the microscope possible? We had lenses long before the microscope was discovered, so what was it about putting lenses together that made the microscope possible? Well, it was pretty simple actually. It's just putting two lenses in a row, one lens sequentially after the other. And so what you're doing here is you're magnifying an image uh, some amount, let's say by four times, and then you're taking that magnified image and magnifying it again. So um, if your second lens is a 10x objective, um, and your first lens is a 4x, then you simply multi multiply the magnifications together to get your total magnification, which in this case would be a 40 times magnification. So <clears throat> it was Robert Hooke and Robert Boyle who did this in Oxford, and when you walk around Oxford, there's these blue plaques that tell you all these historical events, and one of them is that uh, Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke together made a microscope and discovered the first living cell um, and they called it a cell because it reminded them of a cell in a monastery 
and uh, they actually started sketching everything that they saw uh, under the microscope. And that book is called Micrographia, and it's in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. The image here is showing Radcliffe Science Library, but you can actually go take a look at this book on display, uh, and <coughs> it's really fun here. At the bottom right, it shows his first sketch of a living cell in a piece of cork. All right, well, then you might ask, well, why can't we just keep stacking more and more lenses and get greater and greater magnification until we can see individual atoms? And the answer to that is, well, you can keep stacking more and more lenses and getting greater and greater ma magnification, but at some point you're going to reach a fundamental limit of physics. Uh, you're going to reach a diffraction limit. So as light goes through these, uh, these lenses, it bends a little bit, and different wavelengths bend different amounts. And if you're a photographer, you probably already know a lot of this. It's you get chromatic aberration where different wavelengths of light will separate out and start making, you know, the red, green, blue sort of edge lines. And you also just have the fundamental diffraction limit where when you get two little particles so close together, eventually uh, you're unable to resolve them. It's called resolving power. You're unable to differentiate that those are actually two different points next to each other. They just look like one single point together. And this comes up not just in microscopy, but in astronomy and all sorts of other areas. Um, <clears throat> so in astronomy, you're always trying to get bigger and bigger diameter telescopes because you want to resolve that a star isn't just a star, but that it's actually a binary star system, for example, or, or some other anomaly. And uh, the aperture is what d allows you to do that. The aperture is the most important determinant of resolving power. And it's the same in photography. That's why people use larger lenses with smaller f-stops, for example. But aperture is related to the focal length of the lens divided by the f-stop value. Now, you don't need to understand f-stop and focal length and all this stuff, but it's just useful to know that aperture is directly related to the focal length divided by the f-stop. So, for example, you can minimize the f-stop or you can maximize the focal length. But, <clears throat> um, yeah, well, if you increase the focal length, first of all, you're going to crop the image more, so you have less of a wide angle, <clears throat> but you do get greater depth of field. But you kind of have to balance all these things, choosing focal length based on your needs, whether it's microscopy or photography or telescopes or whatever. And um, <clears throat> the, the main thing is that you want to have a wide aperture in order to get the greatest resolution and resolving power. Now, way back in the 1600s, there was a scientist with the last name of Snell who came up with Snell's law of refraction. And uh, then later on, Ab, Ernst Ab came up with this formula sort of based on the same principles uh, of the fundamental limits of optics. Uh, he, he stated that uh, well, he derived this formula where the distance d is is the diameter of your resolving power. So, like, how small of a particle can you can you resolve? Um, and it's directly related to the wavelength of light lambda divided by this big long thing two times n times sine of theta. So this seems like a big complex thing, but it's really not. Uh, n, the letter n there, is referring to the refractive index of the material. So kind of like how dense it is as perceived by the light passing through it. And then uh, sine of theta relates to the angle um, between the, the sample and the lens, the angle of the light. And so that all gets grouped together in this thing that we just call numerical aperture. So instead of using this 2n sine theta, we're just going to condense it all into this simple thing that we call numerical aperture. And in modern optics, if you're using a dry lens, meaning that it's just a lens that goes to your through air to your sample, which is what we use in this lab, the best, best possible numerical aperture is about 1. It's actually about 0.95, but we'll just say 1 for simplicity. So we can just put 1 as the denominator there, and we can say that the smallest possible thing that we can image is the same as the wavelength of light that we're using to, to look at it, the, the, which is in the visible wavelength. So somewhere around 400 to 700 nanometers. Now that's the absolute minimum. Um, now in theory, you might be able to get down to uh, a lambda over two, meaning half of the wavelength that you're using to measure it. So if we have a green wavelength at 500 nanometers, 
uh, what it's saying is basically lambda over two would be 250 nanometers, which is actually pretty small. I mean, that's a that's a nanoparticle. That's that's extremely small, but that's with the best of all possible worlds. That's the absolute theoretical limit. And actually, there's some things you can do to optimize the numerical aperture. One of them is <clears throat> instead of imaging uh, with air, we we put oil over the sample, just a little drop of oil, and you touch the lens to the oil. So light is, instead of passing through different refractive indexes of the glass slide and then some tissue and then a glass cover slip and then air and then a lens, instead it's gonna go through basically the same refractive index the entire way, so minimal refraction. <clears throat> and uh, if we do that, the best possible uh, numerical aperture is more around 1.4, 1.5 maybe, and and in theory, with the best of all possible microscope setups in the world, the best numerical aperture you could ever get is about 2.8. So <clears throat> you could divide your wavelength by 2.8, and that's the maximum. Uh, that's the smallest, I should say, smallest uh, diameter particle that you could image. So it's kind of fun to just calculate those things out. Now after Ab derived this formula, uh, another scientist came along, Rayleigh, and he derived a more complete solution, which, you know, this all sounds like algebra to us, it seems pretty simple, but the derivations for this are incredibly complex and in incredibly cool. Uh, so it involves uh, dual Fourier transforms, Bessel functions, Green's functions, delta functions. I mean, it's a cool derivation, but ultimately it comes down to something really simple. He just said that the smallest resolvable diameter d is going to equal 1.22 times the wavelength of light divided by the numerical aperture of the condenser plus the numerical aperture of the objective. So there's a condenser under the microscope, which I'll show you guys in a minute, and then uh, the objective itself. Those both contribute uh, to the total numerical aperture of the system. But that's kind of a complex formula even still, even though it's just algebra. Really, the simplest embodiment of this formula is the, the, the minimum resolving distance, d, is equal to 0.61 times lambda divided by the numerical aperture of the system. So, <clears throat> so pretty easy. Basically, it's saying, you know, if, if we're talking about the microscopes we use in this course where the numerical aperture is going to be one, then we just say the minimal resolvable distance is 0.61 times the wavelength of light that we're looking at. So it's about half the wavelength of light still. So I hope you think that's as interesting as, as I do. Um, it's okay if you don't like that stuff, uh, but it, it's really cool, just the theory behind all that. Now, you probably just wanna jump into, how do I magnify stuff? And so let's go ahead and do that. So this image kinda shows the basic setup of where the light rays are going and how it's magnifying things. Um, so we have what we call the, the real image and then also a virtual image. It's much easier to just look at this diagram and see what's going on. You can see the specimen itself is in the middle there on the plate, on the glass slide, and then the light is passing through an objective and an eyepiece. Now remember on the microscopes, you not only have a, an objective, which will, on our microscopes, it's either a 4X or a, a 10X or a 40X objective, but you also have a 10 times magnification in the eyepiece. So the 40X objective will actually magnify a total of 400 times because of that eyepiece. And so what the eyepiece is doing here, you can see it's making this virtual image that your eye thinks it's seeing, uh, it's expanding out the image. Um, and it's easier to explain with the diagram just to follow the light rays there to understand it. So this next image shows just some of the earliest neurohistology Back in the day, obviously, they didn't have microscope cameras. They just had to draw out what they saw. So you had to be a good artist as well as a scientist. And they tried to replicate these things as accurately as they possibly could. And it's fun to see the details, how they progress over time. We'll talk more about this next week, though. But one of these images was done by Ramoni Cajal. I'll quiz you next week. Uh, on which one it was, but um, he did some of his studies up at Oxford, and a lot of this history took place at Oxford. There was Sherrington, who was the physiologist who worked with Ramoni Cajal and proposed the concept of the synapse, and he inspired his student Penfield to become a neurosurgeon, 
And, and back in the day, you didn't just become a neurosurgeon. You had to be a very competent surgeon first, and then you were trained in, uh, in neurological surgery. And Penfield, we still use today in the OR, uh, we say, pass me the Penfield 4. It's named after him. Uh, he did some of the first mapping of cortical uh, functions. He studied under Harvey Cushing, who's the father of neurosurgery, and uh, did a lot of other things with neural tissue. And uh, also from Oxford was William Osler, the father of modern medicine. You'll learn more about him in medical school. Thomas Willis, who described the circle of Willis. Um, so I named my boy Thomas after him and also Thomas Lineker, the college where I was at at Oxford. Um, it's sort of like Harry Potter. You have different houses uh, like Gryffindor or whatever. They sort you into different colleges that are all embodied within the University of Oxford. And so you live at your college and it's really a cool place. I, I really recommend going there uh, if you have a year before med school or something. It's one of the best things you can do and uh, preferably longer if you can. It's just really uh, inspiring to see the history and feel like you're a part of it and to be uh, among many other smart people and making contributions and doing cool things that are on the uh, cusp of our understanding. This is where I was able to really start working on my own ideas and my own projects and uh, pursuing ideas that I thought would be valuable and interesting. In, in, in neurosurgery, you very quickly realize that uh, you, you can't fix very much. You can suck away blood, you can screw bones back together, but you never actually fix neural tissue. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was uh, look into ways of using stem cells and regenerating neurons and things like that. So um, I was able to make these three-dimensional uh, synthetic neural tissue constructs where I could guide the neurons to grow in specific directions. And I was also able to uh, create these organoids, these mini brains as they call them, uh, out of uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. So Yamanaka was the orthopedic surgeon who decided to leave medicine and go into research and he won the Nobel Prize for his work. He discovered the genetic factors that are able, able to reconvert an adult cell back into a pluripotent stem cell. And from there we've been able to replicate and uh, recapitulate to some degree the neurodevelopmental process and create these mini brains. They even have a cerebral cortex as you can see in the top middle image up there. And through all of this work um, I've used microscopy and every uh, type of microscopy that we're going to talk about today is something that I've used and that's why I'm including it. There's many other types of microscopy that we probably won't talk about today but I at least want to cover the ones that I've used in neuroscience. You'll also see, even in medicine and surgery, that we use optics all the time. And, and so even if you decide to go into that field and not do research, it's still useful to understand uh, the, the basics of optics and, and why you use different settings that you do. And if you do go into research, it's really important to understand the technologies that we have available to us and what's already been done and what has yet to be done. And really, I want you guys to not just think in this rote sort of manner where you memorize facts and, and repeat what other people have done. It's much better to have the creativity and uh, vision and thinking out of the box to be able to come up with new ideas and new applications of these technologies. So I hope that'll be your mentality as we go through all all this microscopy. So let's just look really quickly at the microscopes that you use in this course. Um, here's a diagram. I just want you guys to know the basic parts, uh, the, the eyepieces, the objective lenses. So scanning is the lowest power, it's the 4x. The low power is actually the 10x and then the high and dry is the 40x. Uh, so it's high powered, dry meaning that it's not an oil immersion lens, it's just a dry lens. We also have a condenser that focuses light onto the sample that sits on the stage and you can control the diameter of that light with the condenser iris diaphragm. There's also a field iris diaphragm and a substage light and then the adjustment knobs that help you focus, those are on the sides. So that's the basics of the microscope, nothing fancy, but it still takes a little bit of uh, time to kind of get used to how, to how to set everything up. So here are a couple other views showing the schematics of the microscope and, and light paths through the objectives just so you get a clear understanding here. There's a couple terms here you should know too. So working distance, um, <clears throat> that is 
the distance between uh, it's the optimal distance that the objective is designed to function at so how far away should the sample be from the lens when you're taking the optimal images and then the other one is parfocal so what that means is that all the objectives on your microscopes they're designed so that when you flip between them uh, they all stay pretty much in focus it doesn't mean that each objective has the same focal length because they're at different lengths away from, from the uh, sample, but it means that based on the design of the microscope, they all will uh, be pretty much, not exactly, but pretty much in, in focus when you flip the dial around and adjust between them. Now, we don't have fancy things on these microscopes like phase contrast and things like that, but there's lots of other options for optical microscopes that can help you enhance both the resolution and the contrast that you're getting. Um, <clears throat> one of the best ways to enhance contrast actually isn't with the microscopes, it's with the staining of the tissue. So that's why in later lectures we're going to talk about different ways of staining tissue so that you bring out the features of the tissue that you want to focus on. So in most of biology and neuroscience, we, we get some useful information out of uh, just optically imaging tissue, but what really helps us enhance the contrast is to actually have antibodies or other molecular labels that can very specifically label the components and features that we want to target. So um, we have a couple ways of doing that. Antibodies are a great way. You can build them to target certain antigens, and then you can either have fluorescent probes directly attached to the antibody, or you can use secondary antibody to label the primary antibody and obtain your images under the microscope that way. When I was in medical school, I worked on a research project involving the CAM kinase 2 signaling enzyme, which you probably recognize as being involved in long-term potentiation uh, for hippocampal memory. And I took a CAM kinase 2 enzyme that was uh, linked to a GFP reporter so I could visualize where the CAM kinase 2 enzyme was in the neuron. And I was able to show how this CAM kinase 2 enzyme interacted with F-actin, the cytoskeleton, in interesting ways and also how it was involved in uh, neural protection and neural injury during ischemic cell death. And as you add more and more uh, antigen targets and more and more antibodies and more and more things that you want to look at, it becomes a little complicated with making sure your secondary antibodies don't bind to the wrong primary antibody and uh, getting everything to line up. So, so how can you do that? Well, you use antibodies from different sources, from goat, from donkey, from things like that. So you'll see one of the take-home problems that I'm going to give you is designing uh, an antibody setup in order to image a couple different targets in the neuron and not having anything cross-react or overlap. So it's just more of a logic problem than anything and kind of gets you uh, <laughs> thinking about molecular biology a bit again. So I think you'll enjoy that. Now, as a side note here, it's just kind of interesting to point out that the man who discovered uh, GFP from a jellyfish was a biochemist named Douglas Prasher, and uh, he couldn't get any funding for his work, so he had to leave science, left academia, and became a shuttle bus driver for a car dealership for like $8 an hour or something, and... Uh, and Never got credit for his work, but many, many other people have won Nobel Prizes using his work to do other things. So kind of an unfortunate, sad scenario in science there, but it happens more often than you would think. Now, in, in order to solve the problem that I'll give you, it helps to understand uh, how GFP behaves to light and un understand fluorescent microscopy. So that's kind of the next step up from optical microscopy. So when we have a fluorescent probe, you have to stimulate it with some amount of light and then it typically gives off a wavelength of light slightly higher than that because a larger wavelength means it's less energetic. So um, there, there's a little bit of an anomaly there which uh, a little bit of overlap you can see in this image how uh, it is possible for the protein to resonate in such a way that it gives back more energy than was put into it but typically uh, that's with continuous stimulation and um, we don't fully understand the mechanisms of how that works, but it's probably like some sort of spring mass damper system where occasionally the resonances will, will um, 
<laughs> compile and, and give back more energy than you put into the system. But in essence, it, it gives it back a slightly lower energy uh, level in the photons. And you can see that in these two peaks. There's an excitation peak on the left and an emission peak on the right. So typically we say, we say that GFP uh, will be stimulated best at 488 nanometers and that it will uh, reverberate and be emitted back at about 510 nanometers. So in order to make this work in a fluorescent system, uh, there's one key piece that you need to make all of this work, and that is a filter. You need to be able to filter very exact uh, wavelengths. So we do not want the 488 nanometer wavelength to enter our image because then everything would just look like green and you wouldn't actually see the neuron. So we need a filter that will filter out from 488 nanometers down and that will let everything pass through that is 510 nanometers and above. And <laughs> fortunately we have filters like that. And so uh, when you apply the filter, it filters out the stimulating wavelength of light and you can see everything that's being emitted by the GFP molecule. Now on this image it shows a generic uh, light source, uh, something like a xenon bulb that has a broad spectrum, all wavelengths of light, and you can use a filter to, to let through only something in the 488 nanometer range, but in reality typically on these microscopes you'll use a laser that is specific to 488 nanometers. Okay, on the next diagram we're going to compare a fluorescent microscope to a confocal microscope. Some of you may have used a confocal microscope, and there's one key piece of technology here that enabled this, and it's actually a pretty old school technology. It is simply a pinhole. So uh, if you've ever made a pinhole camera before, uh, basically you know that you can lift up a flap over the pinhole and put some photographic film behind the pinhole, like in a box, and when you lift up a flap to let light into the box and expose the film, it has to pass through the pinhole. And because it passes through only one tiny small point, it will make sure that everything is in focus on the film at the back of the box. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of the same idea here. So the pinhole enables the light to focus on one and only one plane uh, within the specimen. And depending on how exact you build your system, you can make that focal plane very, very thin. So most confocal microscopes can take, uh, like on the neurons that I showed earlier, um, the, the green fluorescent uh, protein in neurons, those were confocal images taken six layers through an individual cell, so six different focal layers um, through the cell, and then you use a, a technique called deconvolution. It's actually a mathematical function. It's really interesting. Um, so convolution is a complex mathematical function and deconvolution is the reverse of that. You're essentially solving for an unknown variable, the unknown vari variable being uh, the original in focus image. So by doing a deconvolution, you're, you're taking out uh, noise and putting together a reconstructed image of only the th layers that are in focus. So uh, you have to have some computational hardware to do that and uh, confocal imaging just tends to take a lot of time. Usually you have a big sample that you want to image so you can automate it with machinery which is really nice but it still takes a while for the microscope to work its way around the sample take all the layers, take all the images, stitch it all together, do the deconvolution um, and so you can leave it running overnight for example let it do its thing for 12 hours or whatever and and that's nice but eventually because you're stimulating your sample with so much laser light it also will start photo bleaching your sample the fluorescent probes eventually stop responding uh, as much as they did in the beginning and so th those are kind of the weaknesses of confocal but in general it's a super powerful very functional technique and <clears throat> um, confocal microscopes are not particularly expensive either so typically you can find them in, in several laboratories. Um, all right, so uh, with each of these types of microscopy, I should say, make sure you're paying attention to sort of its strengths and weaknesses so that you can decide uh, when you would use a particular type for a particular research project or answering a particular question. Okay, so let's move on to the next type of microscopy, which is electron microscopy. With this, 
uh, there, there are two basic types. Uh, the first simple one is transmission electron micro microscopy. And this is basically like taking a bunch of electrons um, and shooting them all at uh, your sample and then having a photographic film behind your sample. So you're essentially taking a picture of a thin sample, a thin two-dimensional sample, except you're not taking the picture with light, you're taking the picture with actual electrons shooting through the sample. And if you have something dense in the sample, then not as many electrons are going to go through. So, so you get the idea. It's very similar to photon photography. <clears throat> um, the problem with this is that typically you cannot have a sample thicker than one micron. So even imaging a cell is, is not really feasible with this technique. So you have to thin slice everything, which we'll talk about how you do that later in the course. And then uh, the other problem is that since you're using electrons, um, <clears throat> these these don't have color. They don't have different wavelengths that you can elucidate a color. So, so it's all black and white photography. But here you can see that this is false colorization that's been added to the image. So try to think and try to guess what this image is. The orange image, um, <clears throat> it, you can see there's some synaptic vesicles in blue, some mitochondria in green, and then some sort of synaptic density in the middle. Yeah, this is a synapse of neurons. So um, you can image really, really high resolution. In fact, if you think back to Ab's formula, where uh, the, the resolution distance equals the wavelength divided by the numerical aperture, on an electron microscope, what is the wavelength of an electron? Well, uh, you know, normally we don't think of electrons in terms of wavelengths, but it's the whole de Broglie-Bohm theorem. The bigger the particle, the smaller the wavelength. So with electrons, if we have this theoretical tiny, 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 tiny wavelength, well, that means we also have a very, uh, we can resolve a very tiny particle. And in other words, we have an extremely high theoretical resolution. And so that's why electron microscopy is uh, the highest resolving power of all the types of uh, micro microscopes that we'll talk about today. But obviously it has its limits. What you're imaging has to be dead because it's in a vacuum so that electrons can pass through. And, and that goes for scanning electron microscopy as well. So scanning electron microscopy is really cool because you can actually image three-dimensional images, uh, three-dimensional uh, <coughs> samples but uh, you can't really image through them. You're sort of bouncing electrons off of the surface of them. And then the other problem is, um, again, it has to be in a vacuum, so the sample is dead. Uh, but again, because you're using electrons, you have a very high resolution power. <clears throat> and uh, I was actually using a scanning electron microscope in my work at Oxford, I was imaging nanofibers when I was trying to grow neurons and have them follow these fibers to make different networks. And uh, in Oxford, all the all the equipment is in these old old buildings. It's funny. There's there's the juxtaposition of very new buildings and very old buildings. And the electron microscope was in a very old building, uh, like a dungeon with this old window that wouldn't shut all the way. And it was summertime, and this bee flew in and landed on my cheek and stung me. And it was very strange because I am a friend to bees. I have a garden, and bees never sting me. And I don't know why this one did. But anyway, <laughs> the poor thing. Uh, I put it in the electron microscope and just took some images of it, and this is what I got. So you can see in great detail, and you can actually zoom in very, very far on these images and see even greater detail on the surface of this bee. But um, it was sort of this exquisite photography, actually, uh, of this British bee, apparently, that didn't like me. Now, if we look at a, a more neuroscience-related image from a scanning electron microscope, we can see a peripheral nerve here uh, in, closed in a sheath, and you can see the individual axons in that sheath. So, <clears throat> again, this is artificially colored here. Those are not correct colors at all. They've been added in. And this electron microscopy has also been used to do some really cool projects in neuroscience recently. One of them was this uh, joint project between MIT and Harvard and taking these blocks of uh, brain tissue and doing thin slices and putting them in a transmission electron microscope and then labeling in two dimensions every little um, part of the image. 
and then reassembling the stacks of these images back into a three-dimensional image. And by doing so, they were able to obtain greater resolution of brain tissue than we've ever had before. It was the first time that we could see uh, how cells were interacting with each other. How, where were they forming synapses? How were the cells weaving between each other? And, and so we have this really cool video from all of this work that shows us just how complex neural tissue is. And it really makes you realize how amazing it is that we create, we create these intelligent systems out of these complex networks. All right, so um, <clears throat> we've talked about some great resolution uh, microscopy uh, so far, but what if we really wanna go down to the individual atom level? Well, we've already talked about sort of the classical limits to uh, optics in physics, but it turns out that there were these guys uh, who had left their jobs, they had quit science because they were exhausted and burned out and uh, things weren't working out the way they had hoped and they were both unemployed and uh, they built this contraption in their living room um, and they were both physicists and they needed a biologist to really make the, the jump across the gap there. But, um, but these physicists, they came up with this idea of breaking the limits of resolution, of contradicting Ab's formula and, and obtaining super resolution. So they didn't follow the rules of physics and they didn't listen to the limits. They instead used what they knew and, and they broke the limits. They figured out a way around the fundamental physics and uh, that's what's cool about all of knowledge right we learn the laws of the universe and then we learn the exceptions and we learn the nuances and we learn the <laughs> the ways around them so um, <laughs> what they did they built this contraption in their living room uh, and it's kind of like a confocal microscope but instead of shining a bunch of light all at the sample at once and getting this big bright image back they used a very, very low stimulation of light. And what this does is it makes it so the, the probes, the fluorophores, only respond once in a while. So they might just blink, dink, 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 and, and give off these lights uh, that are temporarily separated. And if you record thousands and thousands of these images so that each little blip of light from each individual fluorophore uh, shows up at a slightly different time, then you can reassemble all those images and use what are called um, point spread functions. So, so when the light is given off, it makes sort of these blurry uh, spots, depending on the color of the fluorescence, red, green, whatever. And <clears throat> it, it, if you map the intensity of that light, it looks like a Gaussian curve. It looks like a bell curve. Those are called point spread functions. And if you use a computer to do stochastic reconstruction of all those point spread functions, you can essentially use probability theory to reassemble the highest resolution image possible. And so <clears throat> these scientists won the Nobel Prize for their garage project, or they actually said they built it in their living room, not their garage. And uh, you should read the uh, Nobel acceptance speech of Eric Betzig. It's actually pretty entertaining. He talks about how they had no funding, no no NIH grants, no venture capital, no one supporting them, their own self-doubts, unemployed, multiple business failures, families to support, nothing going on, and they're sleeping on their couch in their living room, and somehow they come up with this Nobel winning prize. It's pretty hilarious. Um, anyway... <laughs> Uh, what this technology does is um, enable us to sort of combine confocal and electron microscopy, the resolution of electron and, and the fluorescent uh, labeling of confocal. And so uh, this is really great for things like trying to elucidate the structures of proteins, the architecture in these postsynaptic densities, for example, at the synaptic cleft. Is there some sort of particular architecture or are these proteins all just randomly arranged? Well, it turns out there's a very specific architecture and, and that uh, when some of these proteins are mutated or when the structure isn't assembled correctly, you can get dysfunctions in the synapse. Um, so for example, Shank 3 mutations, you can get Homer mutations and other things that are thought to be associated with 
uh, epilepsy, autism, and, and at least certain forms of autism, um, things like that. So uh, this type of uh, this type of um, imaging, I'm calling it super resolution, but you can call it storm, uh, uh, which means stochastic reconstruction microscopy. You're essentially using probability theory to recreate these images through computer algorithms, and you can assemble submolecular detail uh, with fluorescent probes, which is an uh, invaluable tool. <clears throat> uh, these images just kind of show, again, what I've been describing. Hopefully uh, it, it'll make sense to you. You can pause the video and, and go through it to make sure that it makes sense to you. The next type of imaging is uh, two-photon microscopy, or some. now we have fancier things, three-photon, whatever, so now i will just call it multi-photon microscopy. Uh, so the way that this works is, instead of using one photon at 488 nanometers to excite a GFP molecule, let's say I double the wavelength of that photon, so almost a thousand nanometers. That means it has half the energy, so it won't excite the fluorophore. But what if I hit that fluorophore with two photons of half the energy at exactly the same time? Uh, those two photons add up to enough energy as the original 488 nanometers that should excite the protein and therefore stimulate it to give off an emission uh, of fluorescence. So this can happen. Uh, it requires true quantum simultaneity, meaning the photons hit the molecule at the exact same time. And in order to help achieve that, we pulse the frequencies of the lasers very, very high, 80 megahertz usually, and uh, it typically also requires specialized fluorophores that respond optimally to this uh, form of stimulation. But what this allows us to do is to penetrate deeper into the tissue so we can image three-dimensional tissue really, really well, typically down to a micron deep, even without clearing away any of the debris, any of the lipid membranes, and any of that. So this enables live imaging, for example, on a mouse brain, or a rat brain, which typically only has a millimeter of cortex anyway, uh, we can image the entire depth of the cortex in a live animal, um, which is a really cool technology. So <clears throat> uh, you'll notice because we're using a longer wavelength, that means we have a lower theoretical maximum resolving power. Uh, but because we can go so deep, um, usually about 800 microns, but maybe up to a, a, a millimeter, um, gives us really high resolution in the X, Y, Z planes, even, so good axial resolution as well. And we can actually combine this with another type of imaging, which I'll talk about in a minute, live imaging, where we use uh, calcium dyes or other dyes to image when a neuron fires. And this enables us to uh, look at, in real time, how neurons are firing in, in a rodent, for example. So really cool technology, really powerful. Um, another form of three-dimensional imaging is called light sheet microscopy. And this one only came out a few years ago. It's kind of futuristic. It's almost like Star Trek. We take this plane of light, like a beam of light, but, but formed into a plane. And we just scan it through a three-dimensional substance. And you use an objective over the, the specimen to capture all the planes of light that are illuminated as the laser scans down the sample. <clears throat> so um, this one is a little different because in order for this to work, the tissue actually has to be cleared. So there's all sorts of clearing methods. There's debates on which clearing method is the best, and it kind of depends what you want to do. But the, the essential idea is that you fixate the tissue um, and then uh, use some sort of membrane, some sort of lipid lipophilic wash to wash out the membranes. And that enables you to see clearly uh, only the tissues that you fixated and stained. Now, if you take a living specimen like a rat brain and fixate it with formaldehyde and then clear away the lipid membranes, you won't have any dyes in there unless you've genetically embedded them. So <clears throat> you can actually use electrophoresis or other things to pass antibodies and labels through the the sample, but that doesn't work as well as if you're able to genetically encode them, for, for example, in a genetically modified animal. And <clears throat> uh, so 
the the clearing is is usually done it's done with a solution called rim solution it's a refractive index matching solution so you're basically trying to match the refractive index make it even through the whole tissue sample so that uh, there's a minimal diffraction of light and <clears throat> this has resolution similar to the other fluorescent um, microscopies that we've talked about but the axial resolution tends to be a little bit worse than two photon simply because you're you're shooting this uh, plane of light that you've used a cylindrical lens to to create and so it's not a true perfect plane of light um, but it is cool because there's actually uh, an online wiki where you can uh, find the instructions how to make your own garage light sheet microscope. Uh, so you're welcome to try and do that if you want. Um, these are also sometimes called selective plane illumination microscopes, SPIM. Um, <clears throat> so I think I think um, this and two photon microscopy are the the fastest best ways to image three-dimensional tissue. If you compare this to confocal, uh, where you have to let it run for hours at a time in order to assemble a three-dimensional image, this is vastly <laughs> superior. Oh, I should mention one other weakness of the light sheet microscopy is that because you're imaging a big three-dimensional sample through, through an objective from far away, um, you, you essentially have to have a large working distance on that objective because you need to see both the surface and the depths of your three-dimensional sample and it just turns out that because of optics and physics uh, the the working distance of the lens is inversely related to its uh, theoretical numerical aperture so in other words uh, longer working distance lowers your functional numerical aperture and gives you slightly worse resolution Okay, the last form of microscopy that I want to talk about is live neural imaging. We can image live neural activity. I mentioned this with the multi-photon microscopes, how you can combine this in. Uh, with, so all of these types of microscopy you can combine together in some way or another. In fact, every year people are publishing new ways that they combine two-photon and spin microscopy. So um, so always keep that, that I, the box open of different ideas of ways to build these and apply these. So live neural imaging, all we're doing is using some sort of dye that lights up when there's a voltage change or when there's a calcium change. So remember, when a neuron fires, if that NMDA receptor opens up and lets a calcium ion through, that will be detected by uh, a calcium sensing dye and give off uh, some sort of emission, fluorescent emission that we can detect. There are many different types of calcium dyes. Uh, there's kinds that you can just apply to the neurons, but any dye that you just sort of use a pipette to squirt over the neurons will typically be a little bit toxic to the neurons. Um, and then there's also genetically encoded uh, dyes like G-CAMPs, G-CAMP5, G-CAMP6, which people are working on to build more and more responsive to action potentials. They have them now where uh, G-CAMP will light up uh, immediately when an action potential fires. It used to be that you needed sort of like a train of action potentials before the, uh, before the dye would actually light up, but now uh, they're highly sensitive to action potentials. And, and because this happens so quickly during an action potential, you can imagine you need a very fast frame rate when you're recording these. These aren't just like, oh, your typical TV, 30 frames per second or whatever. You, you have to have hundreds of frames, maybe even a thousand frames per second to capture some of these action potentials uh, just because of the Nyquist sampling theorem, where you have to sample at least twice as fast as the highest frequency that you hope to capture with high fidelity. So like I said, there's all sorts of different dyes that you can use, calcium sensitive dyes, even voltage sensitive dyes, although those ones don't seem to work as well. But the calcium sensitive dyes can also just have varying characteristics in their effectiveness, the diffusibility, brightness, responsiveness, photo bleaching, toxicity, etc. So for example, the Fura 2 dye um, can emit the same, wa same wavelength of light regardless of whether it's bound to calcium or not, but when it is bound to calcium, the emitted signal is brighter when stimulated by one particular frequency, like 330 nanometers, versus another at 360 nan nanometers. So the ratio of the emission intensity has to be compared when com 
when stimulating between the two different frequencies of light. And interestingly, that's kind of how a pulse oxygenation device senses the oxygen percentage bound in your hemoglobin in your blood. But um, apart from that, there's other types of dyes too, like the endo one dye, which only needs a stimulation frequency at 350 nanometers, but then responds with different emission frequencies uh, when it's bound or not bound to calcium, like 405 nanometers emitted when it's bound and 485 nanometers when it's not bound. So changes in light signal intensity in a region of interest, which you define, you define which region you are interested in lighting up compared to the baseline background interest. Um, so you're, you essentially define a delta F over F, a, a change in brightness over a baseline brightness, which is called ratiometric imaging. Uh, so uh, that is based on calcium concentration, on based on calibration curves and things like that. So it all gets complicated. You don't need to know the details for this, but um, <clears throat> all these uh, signal intensity changes occur very quickly. Uh, these are fast action potentials. And so you have to filter the response signal and record it quickly using high frame rates. This isn't just like 30 frames a second like your television. Uh, you have to record fast enough, like I said, with the Nyquist sampling theorem, you have to record it at least twice as fast as the fastest frequency that you think you might capture. Otherwise, you'll miss the signal entirely. Okay, so those are the types of microscopy I think you should know about for neuroscience applications. Make sure you look over the questions on the end of your uh, Histology 1 lab worksheet just to make sure you can answer those. Um, for example, what technique has the highest resolution or the lowest point spread function in the XY plane? Well, so it depends. Uh, if you're talking about labeled fluorescent markers, then I would say super resolution. But if these are unlabeled markers that you're talking about, electron would have a higher um, resolution. Or uh, what has the highest resolution in the axial direction? You know, some of this depends on your setup and what uh, specific uh, quality of microscope you're using. But if you're talking about uh, normal tissue, uncleared tissue, uh, then I would say two photon and uh, possibly light sheet if you're talking about cleared tissue. Um, <clears throat> the fastest technique for high resolution 3D imaging would be light sheet most likely. Uh, so you can see all of these don't have definitive answers. It kind of depends on the scenario. So don't panic too much about them. But um, <clears throat> there's some examples there. If you wanted to image some unlabeled synaptic proteins, because adding labels might interfere or something, what type of microscopy would you use? Well, transmission electron microscopy is one that we talked about that would show uh, in great detail unlabeled synaptic proteins. Um, Okay, what technique depends on localization of excitation? Obviously, the two photon that we talked about. And then it asks, what kind of things can maximize resolution? So we talked about having a high aperture, uh, low wavelength, um, talked about deconvolution methods, stochastic reconstruction with point spread functions. We talked about using oil and oil, in uh, oil objectives for refractive index matching. Um, uh, yeah, basically anything that uh, decreases wavelength, but you're sort of limited in that regard, if, especially if you're using fluorescent proteins, uh, and then also increasing the functional numerical aperture. There's there's also uh, achromatic lenses, um, which I think were developed by Zeiss, I can't remember, but I think uh, Ab and Zeiss, they were the co-founders of Zeiss <laughs> that we know today that makes the Zeiss microscopes. So anyway, achromatic lenses uh, basically invert the chromatic aberration so that it cancels itself out and, and, and does away with that chromatic aberration. So pretty cool idea there. Um, other questions, things like what technique relies on sequential photoactivation? That would be super resolution. What about simultaneous photo photoactivation? That's two photon. And then talks about what cannot image live cells. So think about um, obviously the electron that we talked about. And if the tissue has to be cleared, well, well then light sheet would be another one. But sometimes you can image uh, small clear brains like in zebrafish using a uh, light sheet. Uh, and then high frame rates for data capture. That's obviously the calcium imaging.
Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll provide you guys the the questions on fluorescent labeling later. It's kind of a project that you can work on that takes place of some of the questions that would have been on the exam otherwise. But since we're kind of limited in lab, uh, we'll replace some of those questions with more of a thoughtful experiment that you can design. Okay, the last thing that we need to do is on the worksheet it tells you to calibrate your microscopes. What we're talking about here is being able to take accurate measurements uh, for each objective that you use on the microscope. This is really simple but it's really easy to mess up so just don't mess up your algebra when you do this. So all we do when we calibrate the, the measurements on the scope is you measure a known distance on each objective. So for example you measure uh, a tenth of a millimeter on the 4x objective on the 10x objective and then on the 40x objective and you can you, you take images at a specific uh, resolution the same resolution for each objective and then you calculate the number of pixels that are found on the image per the known distance so for example if you're on the 4x objective which is a total of 40 times magnification remember because of the eyepiece uh, if you're at 40 times magnification and you measure a millimeter as 800 pixels on your image, well then you know that you have 800 pixels per millimeter or 0.8 pixels per micrometer. And, uh, that, and that is the value that you typically come up with on your scopes. Some of them vary slightly, but uh, at 100 times magnification or the 10x objective, you should have about two pixels per micrometer. 1.98 is typically the average. And then at uh, 400 times magnification or on the 40x objective, typically you come up with eight pixels per micrometer. So <clears throat> just understand how those calculations are done. Work through one if you really want to, just to make sure that you don't mess anything up. Now the important part here is actually how to use this. So let's say you're measuring the length of a neuron or the diameter of a neuron and it comes out as let's say 240 pixels. Well you can go back to your unit conversion and you take 240 pixels divided by 8 pixels per micrometer and you should be able to tell that that is 30 microns in diameter for the neuron. So that's how you convert your pixels to an actual accurate measurement. So make sure you work through that and understand how we got that solution. And you should know also that in image processing software, uh, for example, uh, a great one is ImageJ, which is free, and that's the one we use in this course. You can uh, program th that in as a global conversion so that when you make measurements with a line tool, for example, you no longer have to calculate each uh, measurement by hand. It just automatically will do the conversions for you. But you should know how to do it by hand for the exam. Okay, uh, if there's any questions on this, feel free to email me or comment below. Uh, thank you very much.